So here we are, with the compilation of after story of various events. We'll be starting with the Brown Tails. The matriarch of the Brown Tails family, Ratatus, sends her sister Ciurus along with her husband Yucatan to Victoria. They are scheduled to meet with a Victorian magnate to discuss some business partnership. Ratatus warns Ciurus to not do anything stupid, as this will be the Brown Tails family's first step to contact with the outside world, and supposedly Ciurus' first time leaving the country. After a while, Ciurus and Yucatan are at a party held by their business partner, Mr. Harrison. Ciurus wished to speak with him, as the Brown Tails family can't accept some of the terms in their contract. But Harrison doesn't give much attention, as he thinks he's already generous enough. He also implicitly ridicule our Kaharak friend, and thinks they are not worth to concern for. Furious with his attitude, Ciurus goes to the courtyard with her husband. After she calmed down, Cyrus is still determined to speak with Harrison about the business. In the last few days there in Victoria, Cyrus is amazed by this country. From its machinery, infrastructure, transportation, commerce, and even the electric lights the people use. A far cry from Keharag. She wants Keharag to modernize just like Victoria. So then their kids can taste the fruit of their hard work. And this business partnership is their first step. Yucatan understands, but he seems to be more intrigued by the word kids that Cyrus mention. Cyrus then got all shy and said that the kids she meant is Keharag future children. But it seems raising a kid is already in her mind for quite some time. Well after that, Cyrus talks about Silver Ash and Ratatus. Cyrus understands Silver Ash intention to quickly modernize Keharag. After she sees the state of Victoria by herself. But she still doesn't forgive him for what he did, scheming the Brown Tails family. And she can sense that her sister hates Silver Ash more than her. But also admired him at the same time. Then Ciurus remember the time when she was younger. Young Ciurus and Yucatan went outside their house to play but doesn't invite Ratatus. Ratatus is quite bitter about this. And Ciurus believes she's the one who told their grandpa about her little adventure, and got scolded afterward. A short while later, Ciurus wanted to speak with her sister. As expected she ignored her but let Ciurus enter her room, to see what she's been working on. As the heir of the brown tails, Ratatus got a lot of things to do at an early age. She's currently looking at some intel reports. And one of them is about Silver Ash who will study abroad in Victoria. Both pretty much got the same burden as an heir of the Keharag three clans. And she envies Silver Ash as he can get away from this burden. But later it turns into some kind of admiration after he goes back from Victoria. Leading his family in the country for the better. Back to the present, Ciurus realizes she must have been dumb. Disagreeing with her sister and making trouble here and there without realizing all the burden she has to endure at such a young age. Nevertheless Ratatus still have faith in her, and of course Yucatan as well. Sometime later, the party got disturbed by a noble called Evans and his men. He is Harrison's business associate and supposedly the previous owner of this land. Evans found Harrison fraudulently snatching up shares, depressing prices, and then purchasing the land on the sly while Evans is away from Victoria. So Evans is here to give him some lessons. Harrison can't do much as he still needs Evans for his business. Not to mention he is a noble. On the other side, Ciurus got a plan. They take down some of Evans men and call the police. Forcing Evans to leave the place. After that, Ciurus approach Harrison to renegotiate their previous contract. As it seems Evans will cut his contract with Harrison soon enough. Cyrus offers the Brown Tails to become Harrison's new business associates. And also preventing Evans from threatening Harrison ever again. Then for the second story, an after story of the invitation to wine event. We first see the Grand Tutor side seeing the city with Master Shen. The Grand Tutor informs Shen that he and Liang will soon go to the capital city and Master Shen will lead them using his boat. 
Master Shen expresses sadness after hearing Liang will leave the city. He is a fine leader and he is worried about his quick promotion. The Grand Tutor assures him that Liang has the talent and the resolve. Master Shen understands, then he take the Grand Tutor sightseeing with his boat. And mention that Li is currently looking for Liang. Both friends will soon go to their separate way, and Li wishes to have a drink. Shifting to Du and her father at the inn. Du is preparing to go to the city of Yumen to start her new business. Mr. Zeng is worried but won't stop her daughter to go if that is what she wants. But it's a shame because Du will go and won't inherit the inn. Mr. Zeng will have to close the inn sooner or later. After giving Du a travel itinerary to Yumen. Mr. Zeng wishes Du to bring back a decent man to marry. Du got irritated with what her father said. And then go to Liang's estate, supposedly to help Li find Liang. On the other side, Zhuo Le who is in the inn heard their conversation. And got scolded by Auntie Lizi. Not only Lizi was tasked to clear some problems between Yan officials. And the Sui siblings who reside in Rhodes Island. She is tasked by General Zuo, Zuo Le's father. To accompany the young boy back to the capital city. And preventing him from meeting with the three siblings for the time being. As it seems Zuo didn't know all details surrounding the siblings or the Sui regulator. He is still green. And his recklessness might get him into a trouble. Meanwhile, shifting to our two love bird. We see Ning and Liang together watching a theater play. Both share some conversation like how Liang was once traveling and met Li. And Ning tells her story of how she can become a high ranking member of the Ministry of Rights. She said unlike Liang who rose his own excellence. Ning came from a noble family who has been working for the government for a long time. But like Liang she also takes her job very seriously. She once worked to handle a smuggling and embezzlement case. And after capturing a string of thieves. Her grandpa who is a high ranking member of the government. Invited her to work in the ministry. After some time. Liang said they will rarely meet after this day. So should Ning ever want to meet again. She should send him a letter. Ning is quite shocked to hear that Liang is looking forward to seeing her again. Since he's been so bold. Ning mentions the ribbon jewelry case that Liang has been keeping in his pocket. Supposedly a gift for her. On the other side, Li is with Taifu and Shen. Li was asking for their help to find Liang. But looks like his plan failed to have a bro time with him. Now moving to the third story. After the whole shenanigans in Code of Brawl story. Capone and Gambino got a taste of Lungman's underground world rule. And worse, they met with Lapland who is here for Texas. She said she is scheduled to receive a letter from Syracuse. And told the Lupo to receive the letter for her. Knowing her reputation and strength, the Lupo agree. Later, both are at the city gate and are waiting for the messenger. But no sign of the messenger for almost an hour. Capone suggests they leave and look for him around the slum. As he thinks the other mafia in the city might capture him. They are then in a mafia hideout which consists of some of their men who betrayed them. While sneaking around to gain information, they heard an explosion from distance. They rushed into that place, and see a Syracusan mafioso standing among countless lungmen triad. The mafioso then gives them the letter. When they received it, they are surprised that the envelope has the Signora Cecilia seal. The godmother, the boss of the boss, and the head of state of Syracuse. This is a very important letter, and what makes Gambi no more surprised, is that the messenger turns out to be his old underlings called Tomazo. No way in hell he can receive this and no way he can beat all of the triads alone. So the real messenger must have given him the letter and taken care of the triad. Gambino threatens him to tell where is the original messenger. But Tomazo won't say a word. Moments later, the LGD comes in. So Gambino and Capone rush back to meet Lapland. They meet Lappy in the abandoned building. Although they managed to receive the letter. But since they didn't receive it from the messenger. They are worried Lappy won't take this lightly. Nevertheless she still reads the letter for only a brief moment. 
Capone asks whether the godmother mentioned anything about them. Lappy said due to the trouble their family has been causing in Syracuse. And now making trouble with their acting of lungman. The godmother decided their free trial of living had ended. And Lappy is allowed to do anything with them. Hearing that Capone and Gambino prepare for Lappy to make a move. But to make things interesting, Lappy order them to duel. And the one who wins can live. Gambino is hesitant, although he already causes much trouble. And the godmother literally want him dead. But doing this will dishonor the godmother's order. Capone on the other hand agrees to duel. Gambino sees the bro code, and then also agree. They then fight, but a few seconds later they turn their attention to Lappy. Yet Lappy managed to take them down with a bare hand. But surprisingly Lappy spare them. As Lappy is someone called a lone wolf. She doesn't follow the mafia family order. So she burns the letter and offers them a chance to work for her. To locate the other lone wolf in the city. The story then shifts to the Rat King and the original messenger from Syracuse. They are talking about Capone and Gambino, and the two lone wolves in the city. Here we more or less know the original content of the letter. The godmother has no plan to interfere with this bunch. Out of respect for the Rat King, and as an apology for their transgression. And the Rat King can do anything to them. The Rat King understands and also apologizes for the local triad that had been attacking the messenger earlier. And thank him for abiding by the code and not killing anyone. But then the messenger adds, that the Mafia might have to handle the two lone wolves themselves. If the lone wolves interfere with the Syracuse family business. Such as overthrowing the godmother or disbanding the family system. And once the messenger leaves, the Rat King orders his men to keep an eye on the messenger until he leaves the city. And to keep an eye on Lappy, as Texas got Emperor who has already taken care of her. Now moving to the fourth story focusing on Roy. He and Monique got a task to eliminate the Blood Knight. And it seems they have already sent a couple of their subordinate to do the job. But got defeated by the Blood Knight. And then both of the Lazurites finally meet with him. Instead of going for the kill, Roy and Monique tries to negotiate with him. It is revealed they want to get out of Armalus Union. Either because they are tired of doing Hitman's job. Or feeling the KGCC will soon end their life after their recent failures. Or maybe both. So Roy and Monique wanted to fake their death and also the Blood Knight. As he is clearly being targeted by the KGCC even after retiring. And this job is perfect as dead in the hands of the Blood Knight is more believable. So they plan to fake their death and also the Blood Knight's death. The Blood Knight will lay low somewhere else. And the Lazurites will use their subordinate body to fool their boss. Probably using some arts to make the bodies unrecognizable. And the two Lazurites will take a plastic surgery and live under a new identity. In this story, we also learned a little bit about Roy's story. Since young he was a hunter living in the countryside. Living a relatively stable and peaceful life. But always wanted to improve his living condition. One day he met with an old man who turns out to be the Dark Steel. The Dark Steel recognizes his talent in archery, so he invited him to have a good life. And that is by becoming a hitman in the Armorless Union. Roy is skilled in what he does and rose quickly to the ranks of the Lazurites. But the more time passes, he sees things more clearly. He's just at a under someone's control and is getting tired of it. So he takes the chance to live a better and more comfortable life. And free from someone's control. Some time later, Roy is buying some food in the food stall in the city. He sees the news about the Blood Knight who was attacked by an unknown assailant. And the knight's whereabouts is currently unknown. Hearing this, an infected knight beside Roy expresses his anger. He is angry with those assassins, and the media for milking this incident. Then the infected knight accidentally hit a corporate employee beside him. He pay it no mind, and one thing led to another the three are in a conversation about this news. Seeing they get along quite well. The infected knight invites the two for a drink. Inside the tavern, the boys share their stories and problems. 
The infected knight just got lost in a match. Although his odds are higher, but he fights against a sponsored non-infected knight. So no way the company will let the infected knight wins. He also regrets his decision to become a competition knight. Saying farming back in the countryside is better. As for the corporate slave, he said he always wanted to become a knight. Not a competition knight but rather the campaign knight. But alas he got no skill in fighting. Roy then says the best way to get a better life is to get into business. Or becoming a salesman seems not bad either for a stable income. Hearing this, the corporate employee calls him naive. It's hard to join a good company, the work can give a big pressure. And it's hard to get out. He then said he ditched work today. He's so worn off and wanted to take a day off but he's out of vacation days. And intentionally left his phone battery dead, so no one can bother him. That way he can fool himself that everything is alright. But damn, I can't imagine what will happen the next day. Even the employee is scared as hell since there's a mortgage need to be paid. After a while, the boys finish their drinks and the knight pays it all. For his hospitality, Roy suggests he stay for a night in this bar. And to mingle with the big crowd tomorrow, and keep his head low. Then he leaves the bar without elaborating on things he said. The knight pays no mind to what he said and goes out of the bar. But soon he is approached by some armorless union. The knight has been refusing to cooperate with the KGCC. And since the blood knight is no longer here to protect the infected knight. The armorless is free to take his life. Sometime later, Roy and Monique have done their plastic surgery. They are now under the new identity, Joel and Donna Terrell. A married couple apparently. Then suddenly the doctor comes in, and Joel immediately finishes him with a bow. As they need to prevent anyone from knowing they have done plastic surgery. Although judging from Donna's dialogue, it seems the Dark Steel know about them. The two loving couple can now have a moment to relax and go on a vacation. Donna wanted to visit the beach, either it's Dossoles or Siesta. But Joel suggests they buy a villa in the countryside and hunt some games. Wherever they go, they should make it a team effort. For the fifth story. It's the after story of the Heart of Surging Flame event. And supposedly before the Code of Brawl event. We see the mayor of Siesta Mr. Herman. Is busy taking care of the relocation of Siesta to become a nomadic city. The volcano will erupt anytime soon. So they need to work fast. He then meets with the head of Mountain Dash Logistics Company. Ural and his son Bison. Who he invited to come along to see the world and learn more about his father's business. Ural initially here to sign a contract about his company, will helping the city relocate. However, he had a new proposal. He wants his company to be able to start a new subsidiary in Siesta. Not restricted by local competitors and messengers. In exchange, his company will help relocate the city free of charge. And helping restructure the city for better income. He also mentions other benefits. After establishing a new logistics company built off of Mountain Dash, Siesta will be able to facilitate free trade and establish a network of trade agreements, not indebted to any political entity. And Siesta will be able to enter the markets of foreign countries as a neutral entity, becoming a commercial hub, capable of supporting local businesses and government. Herman then surprisingly asks Bison about his opinion. He doesn't personally involve with this project. But confident the company has both the vision, and capacity to meet Herman's expectations. Herman is amazed by Bison's understanding of the logistics companies. Kinda reminding him of his daughter. And after that, Herman accept this proposal. They then continue to talk outside, while having some food and wine. But this time more about their life instead of business. They can see people are busy managing their stuff for relocation. But some services are still open for business. Siesta is a city built by Herman to honor his late wife. And he will make sure the next nomadic city of Siesta will become a wonderful place. Ural also mentioned his wife is also his motivation to enlarge his company. His wife has been ill for some years now, 
between his sick wife and young son. He considered scaling down his business to have more time with them. But his wife who was in Rimbaliton keep sending him letters so that he will not stop turning his company for the better. And here they are now, one of the most successful logistics companies in Lungman. Herman also shares a story about his daughter Salon. For some reason Salon never invited him to see her in Victoria. And he is surprised when he learned Salon hired someone to pretend to become her father in the parent-teacher conference. He came that day to attend the conference and is mad about what she did but eventually feel proud of Salon, as it means she has no trouble even when she's away in siesta or her family. And Salon choose a very talented person to pretend to become her father. And Herman ended up hiring him to become his secretary. After sharing stories, the two men then toast their glass of wine, and hopes for a smooth cooperation. Moving to the last story, time for some comedic relief. After the Mansfield break event, Giselton was incarcerated in Mansfield. For impersonating a guard and assassination attempt on Anthony. He once sent a letter to his employer to free him from prison. It takes a while, but he finally receives a reply from his employer. Telling Jess to be patient and cause no trouble. When the time is right his employer will free him and double his compensation. But turns out he doesn't get any help from them for a long time. And even the letter is starting to yellow. But he still believes they will free him. He still keeps his calm and acts all haughty ever since he got imprisoned. And because of his attitude, other prisoners and guard tend to make fun of him. And guards often order him to do a special assignment. That is cleaning the toilet. But Giselton pays no mind. Once he gets out he will have his revenge. After toilet duty, Jess meets with a friend of his called Rick. Who he has been helping with some stuff. But then other prisoners approach Jess and tell him to fight with them. Against the B's own prisoners. Jess Elton doesn't want to do it, but he still goes to check things out. In the arena, a bunch of A's own and B's own prisoners gathered to fight. While the guards are just watching this as their entertainment. Jess Elton got irritated by one of the B's own prisoners. But he remembered the letter from his employer to not cause trouble. So when the fight started he just stand there like a statue. A couple of B's own prisoners turn their attention to Giselton. But he used his arts to harden his skin and prevent the prisoners from doing any harm. The A's own prisoners who see this and had enough of his attitude. Also started to attack him. One thing led to another, it's just Giselton versus everyone. But they can't cause any harm because of his arts. So one of the prisoner goes to fetch the water Giselton used to clean the toilets. And splash him with it. He reeks with an awful smell, and the prisoners and guards laugh at him. He almost let out his anger. But he still remembers what his employer told him and goes back to his cell. After washing his clothes, he meets with Rick once again. Here it is revealed Jess has been nice to him for a reason. He loves to manipulate people. And he's trying to spark Rick's hatred toward his wife. By giving him a fake letter from his wife. Telling him that his wife had enough of him and will marry someone named Bill. But Giselton messed up. As Bill, Rick's brother, is only 15. But then he convinces Rick again it must be other Bill. In which Rick thinks it's the carpenter he knew who just lost his wife. Then Jess tries to convince him to take revenge on his wife. But before Giselton can finish, a guard calls Rick to go out, his family manages to raise money for bail, and the one who paid the bail is his wife. Hearing that, Rick is relieved and rushes to finish his parole paperwork. And just like that, Giselton loses his entertainment. Then the guard approaches Giselton. It is revealed the guards know everything about what he's trying to do. And luck's actually on Rick's side, as his wife just sold their house. And scraped enough to pay the bail. The only trick the guards do is delaying Rick's paperwork for a week. So they can see Giselton doing his tomfoolery longer. He got beaten, humiliated, and fooled. And almost fight with the guard in front of him. But soon calm down after remembering the letter. While the guard is disappointed as he can't test his new taser on Jess. 
and then orders Jess to clean the toilets again. Later at midnight, Jess is writing a letter to his employer. Initially his letter is filled with pride, yet this time he can only begs his employer to release him as soon as possible. The screen turns black, and shifts to a bar where two men are watching the television. Turns out this whole story with Jess Elton is fabricated by a Colombian reality show. That's why some things here are inconsistent with the Mansfield break story. Such as the pharmaceutical company where Jess Elton work. And whether his story in the prison is true or not, I think it depends on what you think for now. That should be all. Adios.